Welcome everyone to today's panel on women impacting the global market. We have a terrific panel lined up for you today, and I am going to briefly in, in alphabetical order uh, introduce our panelists, and I'm going to ask them to give a little bit of, to, do, to introduce themselves and give an introduction of who they are, what they do, and how they work in the global community. So in alphabetical order, I will first introduce Jillian Henker with Sisu Global. Hello. Hi. Yes, I'm Jillian Hinker. I'm a, a co-founder and president of Sisu Global. Uh, we're a medical device company based in Baltimore, Maryland, that has uh, our first device out on the market, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa and also uh, in Ukraine. So our first device is around uh, taking blood from a patient, being able to filter it and give it back to that same patient immediately, especially when blood isn't available. Fantastic. Look forward to hearing more, more about all your, about your work. Uh, next, let me introduce Christine Stani with Sybil. Christine. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Stani, a founder and CEO at Sybil Corp. We are a governance innovation firm headquartered out of North Bethesda, Maryland, and we specialize in establishing proof of governance, which uses a computational governance system to help measure the effectiveness of policy for regulated uh, entities. And so as we look to work with regulated uh, ecosystems that may have global presence, um, that will be really, really important to uh, the global market. So looking forward to being on the panel and thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Christine. And next, let me turn to Stephanie Van Putten uh, with Visible Figures. Stephanie. Hi there. I am a exited tech startup founder, venture capitalist, MIT lecturer, all in the ESG space. Now executive director of an organization called Visible Figures, which is a network and media platform for Black women global leaders across the African diaspora. Thank you, Stephanie. And last, certainly not least, we have Laura Winston, who is uh, the principal with Offit Kerman. Uh, Laura. Yes, hi, everybody. I'm Laura Winston. I am an intellectual property attorney and the IP practice group leader here at Offit Kerman, which is a firm uh, with several offices along the East Coast and in Los Angeles. Uh, I work a, a lot with trademark owners domestically, helping them to secure their rights both here and outside the United States. I also work regularly with uh, clients from other countries around the world, helping them to protect and secure their trademark rights here in the United States. Thanks, Laura. So. Uh, first, let me turn to a, a couple questions for uh, Christine and Jillian, and I'll start with Jillian. Uh, Jillian, how how did you expand from the U.S. market to the global market with your company? Uh, so I would say that our focus was initially on the global market. We consider ourselves to be more in the global health space. Um, so a lot of our primary markets that we were initially focused on were overseas. Uh, being a U.S.-based company, though, that means that we did have to look at other uh, operations or logistics that other companies don't normally start off looking at um, when operating and, and working with customers overseas. Um, but that was kind of part of our initial mission statement is bringing healthcare to every community. Um, and that just is where we started. Was there what, what data and information did you use to help determine if, if that was going to be the right move for you? Uh, so we kind of did it a little bit of a multifaceted way. I'd say that the startup way is kind of the down and dirty. You're, you're using your network. You're talking to folks um, and you're leveraging the connections that you already have. So for us, we were able to have a connection with hospitals already in East and West Africa. And uh, we're also looking, though, at some of the just data analytics around like ease of doing business in different countries, as well as looking at the regulatory environments, which actually counterintuitively, we were looking for more regulated environments and also places where 
we could get connections to professionals who were working as a medical device, regulatory, super important to us, as well as having uh, those feedback systems and uh, a mixture of public private systems that we could work with. Um, usually some markets are dominated more by private or by public. We want to have a good mixture to have this as kind of the initial test model before we again would expand to, to other markets beyond just kind of our initial ones. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, <clears throat> Christine some of the same same questions. Or tell me about your expansion or your pre preparations to expand from the U.S. Uh, globally with your company. Yeah, so definitely in the preparation phase. Um, but looking at some of the similar items that that Jillian mentioned, um, definitely as in in, in part of pre preparing. For uh, to expand globally. We looked at a lot of the IP, right? Um, and uh, uh, my co-founder and I hold a patent um, in our space um, and, you know, got that patent here in the U.S., but surely we wanted to see what other markets we could bring our intellectual property to. Um, and so part of our, our research and preparation was looking at the regulatory uh, focus in the jurisdictions that we were preparing for. Um, you know, in one of the particular areas uh, in Europe, um, looking at their focus on what was actually happening, what was current, so AI and data privacy and those things. And so um, that is what helped us really to identify the jurisdictions that we would file IP protection in uh, to really lay uh, the groundwork. And then, you know, also looking at research, um, what is the size of the problem that we're solving and what would be the impact um, to the community? I think when you're bringing in a technology or a novel invention, it's important to understand the human element. Um, so the World Economic Forum has um, incredible research um, around uh, digital transformation, the digital trail. Um, and so we considered a lot of those um, uh, items as we were looking to plan our expansion. Thank you. And we like hearing that you have a, have a U.S. patent. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And Christine, what did, uh, or Jillian, what, what did you do to have to prepare for doing business globally? And where did you find the resources to assist you? Uh, so again, a lot of it comes through networks and, and people that have the scars of doing business in different places that we can definitely learn from. Uh, and that would be kind of from folks who, uh, you know, we get through uh, either university connections or other places locally here in Baltimore, uh, where again, I guess people have heard about the port now nowadays, but a lot there is actually a lot of exports that come out of this region. A lot of people doing international business. Um, initially, we started in Michigan and then actually moved to Baltimore, our company, um, about a year or so in. So that's where just doing uh, the local community here has given us a lot of insight in being able to do that. Um, so, but I would say also, yes, looking and, and connecting with those folks in the region that you want to start off in um, and see what the, uh, again, I always look at the ease of doing business and try and factor that in, but also to say, it's all about who you know as well locally and getting those inroads and seeing who can can be of great um, value to get into those different places. Connections can be critical. Yeah. Um, Christine, do you have any in, anything you'd like to add in terms of just preparations for doing business and where you found the resources to assist you or where you're finding resources to assist you? Well, I think on, um, so a couple of things, resources on the legal side, it's important to have guidance and expertise um, in these areas to understand um, the uh, patent and IP laws in the jurisdictions that you plan to enter um, and to go through that process because it is very uh, complex and making sure that you're responding in a timely fashion. So that's one thing. But I, I also want to echo what Jillian said is having people there that understand um, the culture and understand the need and the problem that you're solving is absolutely critical. Um, and so when you're preparing to enter into a, 
um, a, a different jurisdiction, those things matter, right? Um, so making sure that you have connection and resources, that you understand um, the way they like to do business and um, making sure that there's, a, there's an understanding there is, is critical. Thanks, I completely agree. Uh, so let's well, let's turn now to uh, to Stephanie. And uh, Stephanie, you have a great record of success in working to help women in tech, and you've raised over a million in venture capital. What are you seeing as the challenges facing women-owned businesses? Uh, well, access to capital for sure. It continues to be a challenge in the space that I'm in. Um, I come from an enterprise software background. It's really challenging to build enterprise software via bootstrapping. Um, and we are still at about 2% of global venture capital that goes to women and 0.3% of that that goes to black women. Um, and so what that means is a uh, tremendous difficulty to scale, to hire, to meet compliance, to, um, to get patents, um, and so oftentimes there is a chasm that black women business owners in my space reach um, that is very difficult to cross without uh, access to capital. And, and, and it, it's so impressive with what you've done, given especially given the the numbers that you're that you're reciting and that women and and um, underrepresented communities are facing. Uh, what do you see as the most common challenge you see as a woman-owned business uh, struggling with? Yeah, particularly with the demographic of women that I serve, again, uh, venture-backed um, women business owners, um, the most common challenge I've observed is hiring senior, hiring and retain, retaining senior executive talent. Um, it's one of the things that I haven't really seen a lot of research on to date, but just anecdotally, um, I do believe that there is bias at play in terms of how effective uh, Black women, C uh, women CEOs are at attracting the talent um, necessary to uh, achieve some of the loftier goals um, in the spaces that I'm in. And so there's a lot, I think there's still a lot of re-education that needs to take place um, in terms of what a woman business leader looks like um, and, and how we can mitigate a lot of the bias involved in, um, in following and in, in supporting women leaders. Well, just to, to follow up on that, what, do you, what are your thoughts on mitigating the, the bias and, and supporting women leaders? Uh, it's a multifaceted problem and it starts early. Um, I have a two-year-old son who I am already um, educating to uh, combat the bias of what leadership looks like. Um, so I think it starts early and often through media, um, through K through 12 education. And then of course, um, uh, post-secondary education I do see a lot of progress in um, in athletics, for example. So we have a lot more co-ed sports leagues um, that are led by women captains. I do think that makes a difference. These things start really early and they're reinforced all throughout our academic and professional careers. Um, and so I'm a big advocate for all hands on deck in terms of how we reshape the perception of what leadership looks like. Yeah, I'm getting to be a big fan of Caitlin Clark. Good time for for women's basketball. Absolutely. Uh, let me uh, let me. Uh, this was not one of our scripted questions, but let me let me ask uh, uh, Jillian if you have anything to add in in terms of sort of um, overcoming the the bias and and steps that women can take. I don't know. I feel like Stephanie's doing pretty well to, to start them young um, and, and definitely outlined that. I mean, I, I would just note that the what I've, again, heard is the, the statistics that she just quoted are actually not going in the right direction from what I've heard as well. They're actually going 
down. So we're regressing since the pandemic on those numbers that she even stated. So I think that there's a lot to do. Again, I, I can't say it better than she just did. So um, yeah, uh, there's, there's a lot to do, but I think us being here and, and those of us in this space um, are, are trying to just build awareness and, and get our faces out there and show what we can do. Great answer. Christine, anything to add? Yeah, I keep I keep following up Jillian here, but but um, you know I've taken the approach of just doing the work, right? Doing the work, um, though uh, these biases and barriers exist. Um, trusting your gut, having conviction, um, continuing forward. Entrepreneurship is one day at a time; it's one step at a time, and so. Um, I think when you're focused on the work and um, you have that conviction um, that uh, your path is 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 made and 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 laid out, and so um, I think again uh, to back up Jillian is just being in the in the room, having the conversations, and um, putting all of those things together um, will will bring the change. And and part of you know creating change is actually being what you're seeking. And so I think we have to do a really good job of being that change. Christine, I'm sorry, can I interject? Christine, I noticed that your co-founder is your husband and yes. you don't talk a lot about spousal support when we talk about women leaders. Is there anything that you can speak to about that dynamic and how that's been really helpful for you in your trajectory? I, well, I, it has been incredibly helpful. Um, oftentimes I do share that, uh, you know, when you, are building a family with your with your husband like you there's no greater partner um, uh, than than your spouse and so to go into business with um, my husband um, who I trust who is my biggest supporter and my um, you know as someone that I look up to and highly respect and regard um, it gives you the support that you need like if you if you go into a room and maybe you you don't have that support. I know at least, <laughs> right? Um, that I've I've got that support and that I'll keep going. So I think that's important, and I appreciate you bringing that up, Stephanie. Is that we also have to surround ourselves with people that um, want to see us win and are encouraging and supporting because entrepreneurship is is a very um, challenging uh, road. You have this vision. You feel entrusted with this vision. You are working towards uh, bringing this vision into fruition, not for yourself, but for others, for the betterment of others. Um, and so not everyone is going to get it, right? And there will be some that do. So surround yourself with those people because it's important um, to keep going. It takes, it takes a village for it to have support. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie, let me go back and, and uh, ask you just where do you see opportunities for women to gain an advantage in the global market and, and how can a professional network help? Mm, well, um, in terms of geography, I would definitely say that Western Europe is leading the charge in at least um, incorporating gender equity and compliance and reporting, which is very encouraging for, for me. Um, because I'm a firm believer in um, measurement as a pathway to progress, even though it's not a surefire way of solving all problems. Um, awareness is, is a very important first step. And Western Europe seems to be one of the few geographies that's um, really leaning into that. Um, I also really see an opportunity in ESG. Obviously, I'm biased. Um, I joined the board of Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm all things climate change. I teach a course at MIT um, focused on how to measure and report on scope one, two, three emissions. And I've noticed a lot more women entering in the space and taking leadership roles. Um, and even though there are a lot of political challenges at present, I do think in the next 50 to 100 years when um, more and more evidence um, reveals itself about the situation that we're in, the fact that women are leading the charge in this space is going to be a competitive advantage. 
Thanks. Uh, let me follow up with one more question. Uh, so how do you promote a positive state of mental health with all the work you're doing and how does your network support you? Oh, I am, I'm very intentional about mental health and wellness. Um, it's something that I have incorporated into the work that I do with visible figures. Um, starting off with removing the stigma and taboos around psychotherapy and talk therapy um, to really encouraging um, just healthy ways to cope, whether that's uh, weekly massages, acupuncture, hikes, um, because I know that in the spaces that we're in, um, imposter syndrome, tall poppy syndrome, you name it, it can really wear on you over time. And um, there's a book I read recently, The Body Keeps the Score, which talks mm -hmm. about how um, without a release and a healing of this constant trauma um, that we're experiencing from microaggressions to pay inequity, it builds up in your system. Um, and so I am very bullish and a, a large evangelist of prioritizing um, outlets and ways to uh, mitigate a lot of the trauma that you're experiencing day to day without even being conscious of it. Great, great advice. Um, Laura, I am gonna get to you in a second, um, okay. but let, let me let me ask our other, other panelists if you wanna add in anything on how you promote a, a positive state of, of mental health and, and, and how your network supports you. Yeah, so I can kind of speak to that. You said hike, and that's my sort of my love language. <laughs> um, a lot of uh, Sybil uh, and, and our offering was ideated um, on the hiking trail. Um, and so I do believe as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as someone that is looking to bring change to the world, you have to be out in it, understand it, touching it and be connected. Um, and um, mental health is is extremely important um, because you're going to be in very complex and demanding uh, environments and you have to be able to make the right decision and, and remain in your North Star, right? Um, and so all vectors have to sort of be pointing in the same direction. So um, you, you also have to have a relationship with yourself um, and self-care and self-love. And um, so you, you form discipline around building your company and expanding your company, but surely we must have discipline around how we treat ourselves as well. So um, getting out in nature is incredibly um, impactful. Um, you know, going to the gym, home gym, or just going out for a walk, incredibly impactful because if we're not whole and well, we can't show up whole and well. So it's prioritizing um, yourself as well um, and, and being able to understand that it's the whole thing. Uh, it's, it's mind, body, spirit, soul, all of it connected. Julian, anything to add? No, I, I agree. I even have a, a mentor who asked me, did you go on your run today? Because he knows that my mind will be different pre-run and post-run. Um, so I, I love going out for just, again, just a run just in the city here. And um, it, it can change your whole day. And I think yeah. for all entrepreneurs, especially, your day can be a roller coaster where you <laughs> can start off terrible. You get this one email and you're like, man, and then literally within the same day, Get a great email and then you're on top of the top of the mountain so i think that's where it's yeah just kind of trying to make sure you take care of yourself and all those hills and valleys and i wrote down the book title that somebody just said because yeah it's it's just hard for people to also know what you're going through um because it's also pretty specialized to that situation for every company for every founder so just know that yeah you have to take care of yourself because only you know kind of what you're going through even if other people have been there before so but again it, it always helps to have folks yeah that are supporting you and and kind of can still help you through that so to again echo what was earlier said so thanks <laughs> laura you, do you would you like to weigh in on the, the on the mental health and wellness uh, question as well well, I wrote down the book title too, and I also I need a mentor like the one that Jillian has, who's going to um, make sure that I do that exercise. Uh, I, I definitely see a difference on those days when I take that time 
um, to exercise versus, um, you know, when I'm just sedentary at my desk. And um, I, during, during the pandemic, I discovered I needed to adjust my thinking about cold weather um, mm. and make sure that I, I live in New York City and it's, it's quite cold here in the winters sometimes. And um, I was always somebody who would say, oh, I can't go out in the winter, I'll just exercise indoors if I was doing that. Um, during the pandemic, I realized that I would just never leave the house and get any fresh air if I didn't get out um, for walks, no matter what the weather, and really just sort of reframed my thinking. And I'm glad to say it's carried over and uh, I'm no longer intimidated by that, you know, 25 or 30 degree day. I'll, I'll get out, you know, just because that air really helps to clear my mind. Good advice for everyone. So, well, Laura, let's, let's, uh, change gears a little bit. So taking a, a company global means preparing for protections. And as an, an IP attorney, can you talk about what a company needs to do to protect their IP and their business when going global? Yes, I'll be glad to. And I, I'm going to start just by using uh, Christine as really a model example um, when she spoke about um, having her patent, um, which uh, was obtained in the US, and being strategic when going global about making sure that patent rights were secure in other countries. Um, there are, um, there's a treaty called the Patent Cooperation Treaty or the PCT that um, many countries have with each other that makes it um, easy to extend patent rights from one country to another. Um, so that's something that if you have an invention or new technology, you'll want to explore. Um, on the, the trademark side of things, um, it's if you have a brand and you wanna take that brand uh, into other countries, it's, it's very important to take proactive steps. Um, uh, in many countries, there is a principle called the first to file principle, where if you, don't file an application to register your trademark and somebody beats you to it, um, they're going to have rights ahead of yours even if you start using the trademark um, um, bef uh, before they're actually using it. And um, some people will worry that this could be an expensive uh, proposition to protect your trademark in various places. And I'm not going to deny that it can be a costly venture. Um, especially with limited access to capital, as, uh, as Stephanie was discussing, but uh, there are ways to be strategic about it. Um, with, with products, it's a good idea to figure out the countries in which you plan to do business and also consider countries in which your products could be counterfeited and seek trademark protection in those places. And there are filing strategies like the international registration system, uh, which enables protection, getting um, an application filed in up to more than 100 countries with a single form. Um, and also um, other uh, regional strategies like the European Union um, trademark registration uh, that can make, uh, make it more practical, manageable and efficient. Uh, the third thing I wanted to mention, which is really, I think, tangential to IP, but comes up a lot in, in my practice, is just making sure that you're following, that you have advice on and are following the various privacy and data protection regulations that exist in countries around the world. Uh, the EU is pretty famous for having a very strict, or it's called the GDPR, um, data protection uh, regulation. It's very easy to run afoul of it, and other countries have similar things. And especially if you're collecting data, you have an e-commerce commerce platform, um, it's, it's important to make sure that you're uh, following the regulations in the different countries. Thanks, Laura. Uh very helpful helpful advice uh, can you also give us some examples of dangers companies face when going global um, and how they could have avoided a, a dangerous situation yeah. 
And unfortunately, I've seen this with a, a couple of clients that I've had to work with, and it it, it stemmed from this um, uh, sort of um, not not recognizing that that there's this first to file uh, provision and getting uh, finding that they were foreclosed in different places. Um, we had an experience with uh, a company that's it's um. A, a niche uh, workout gear and apparel and footwear company um, that we work with that has a very loyal fan base. And uh, when they wanted to expand their and, and they do sell overseas. And uh, when we sought a trademark registration in China, which is a very common country for piracy, they discovered that someone had already registered their trademark. Now there are. Um, there can be ways to deal with those besides just throwing up your hands. Um, for example, often these will be registered and not used. And if they're not used after a period of three years, you can cancel the registration. But obviously, that's going to take money and resources and time to work that out. So, uh, you know, prevention is really the, the best way to go here. Uh, we had another situation um, where we have a client who in the cosmetic services and products field and uh, they were very successful. They started in Southern California. They were very successful in sp expanding to the East Coast and uh, in between. And they also uh, want to do business globally and somebody who thought it was a great brand name beat them to the punch in Australia, not even a country that you think of so much in the piracy context. And they're really stuck now not being able to not only register their brand there, but even open up a location there, they would be at risk of infringing this brand that came later just in a different country. Um, and I even have one client in the um, who offers training services for a particular industry that um, has a thorn in her side where somebody in Canada started using the same brand and that's just our neighbor to the north and um, they've gone into other countries, but they're they're foreclosed in Canada. And um, just uh, if you'll bear with me for another moment, it, it happens to big companies too. There's one yeah. very large consumer facing tech company that uh, shall remain nameless that famously rebranded a couple of years ago and they've been refused a trademark registration for their new brand in Brazil because of a prior existing company there. Um, and uh, I've been talking mainly about a trademark uh, um, cautionary tales here, but I'll just throw in that it happens in the patent context too. And there was a news report recently about um, a sneaker company that, um, had its design patent actually is in Europe. It's called a design registration invalidated because um, a famous pop star was wearing the sneakers that were the subject of the design patent more than a year before the application was filed. And there's a grace period of one year to file after disclosure. So they, they ran afoul of that by allowing somebody to uh, go on social media with their product. So all, all good reasons to seek advice well in advance. Um, I appreciate it. I think it was Stephanie who talked about working with an attorney because I, I never like to be the one to say that for fear that it's going to sound self-serving, but um, there really is a benefit to seeking out the right advice and taking those steps uh, in the countries where you're hoping to do business. Thanks, Laura. I think that's all great advice. And I'm going to have to put in a plug, too. So uh, part of uh, some of the members on, on my team in the Office of Policy and International Affairs include our IP attaches who are located in embassies and consulates around the world. And, and they are, are, can be very, very helpful to U.S. stakeholders who are entering foreign markets or conducting business abroad. So if you do need you know, assistance, uh, don't don't hesitate to to follow up with uh, with the USPTO and our, our attaches and and others on our team may be able to offer some help as well. Uh, with that, let me uh, let's see. I think we have we have a time for a, a few more questions. So I'm going to go back and talk about just doing business abroad. 
um, long ago, I remember I took a class in international marketing, which I found to be kind of fun. And I had a project where I ended up looking at a country and a specific product and my recommendation, and I ended up getting an A, but my recommendation was don't go there. Don't do that. It's not the right time. So, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested in hearing from you, uh, especially uh, Christine and Jillian, probably most relevant for you. How, how did you determine like market needs in other countries and how did you identify existing competition and, and whether, you know, figuring out the, navigating the landscape and knowing where to, where to go? Uh, Jillian? Yes. Uh, so I would say kind of the first step, again, jumping head in was just getting on the ground. So my approach was getting on the ground uh, and then just asking a lot of questions of, of folks on the ground. Um, so again, as a medical device, talking to a lot of clinicians, going to a lot of hospitals, as well as talking to folks in policy and uh, those in business and logistics. Um, so that's kind of where I, I started that out as a, a baseline to kind of map out those ecosystems and then kind of see where I could lay over other dynamics from other countries uh, on top of that. So I went to a couple sample countries, like in East Africa, I think I've been to four or five, just to just kind of get a baseline understanding of how things work and then go through and, and make an evaluation from there. Again, looking at product fit is the most important, as well as then kind of the general business landscape and uh, policy landscape. So I would say, yeah, boot, boots on the ground and getting yourself on the ground is kind of how, how I approached it, so. Christine, how about you and your, your preparations? How are you determining your, your market need in other countries and, and identifying competition? Yeah, so um, a, a couple of things um, going into market need and, and market fit. Um, we specialize in, in governance. And so um, anywhere where there's regulation and <laughs> um, policy that immediately says, OK, this problem will be existing in this market. And so um, it was easier to identify market fit just surely by the um, the the area and the problem and the size of the problem um, we are are solving, um, but in terms of compu uh, competition, um, it really started in the patent process, um, doing those you know international searches, um, getting uh, you know choosing we chose um, uh, USPTO as our ISO. Um, and so getting that report back and just understanding what existed today. And I think for any inventor, when you're when you begin to realize that you're bringing something novel to the world, um, you it's a big responsibility, right? It's a big responsibility. And um, and so part of what we have prioritized as an organization is understanding that responsibility and championing the education of why this change needs to happen. Um, so uh, we, we have focused our, our work in understanding what exists today. Um, and what we have found is that our solution expands an existing um, ecosystem of solutions, auditors, and you know, what we call first layer governance solutions, where maybe there's attestation and risk assessment um, but we understand our lane and our uniqueness, and we're excited that we have the patent to establish that novelty. Great. Uh, Stephanie, uh, in addition to research and de determining market needs, does, does funding access change when you're looking to go overseas? Mm. Mm. Um, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of restrictions um, for taking outside funds if you go on to raise later, larger rounds from US based investors, um, simply because um, it can raise complications in your exit strategy. Um, so, some US based investors kind of frown upon. Um, having foreign investors on your cap table, 
but there are some creative ways that you can um, get capital through debt um, or other alternative equity arrangements that I do know some entrepreneurs uh, have leveraged, but it does add some complexity that um, I know a lot of US-based early stage startups just simply avoid. Thanks. So we're, we're coming to the end of our program, but I wanna have each of you give a, a takeaway. Uh, I'll start with, with Laura. What's the best advice or lesson you would share for anyone choosing to take their product global? As I, as I said um, earlier, it would really just be to make sure that you've secured your rights in the brand uh, in those countries uh, where you're planning to do business and to the extent your budget will allow in countries where you're at risk of counterfeiting and piracy as well. Um, that was primarily trademark related, but I'll also mention again that if you have an invention or new technology and uh, that to, to seek patent protection and make sure that you are trying to get that patent protection extended um, internationally as well. And one thing I didn't mention earlier that I'll throw in now, I, it came up a little bit when I mentioned that design patent uh, cautionary tale is that there are time bars and on sale bars to getting patent protection. So seek out advice early and be mindful of that. Thanks. Let me ask the same question of Jillian. Yes, um, I would say so again, my approach is a little bit more like jump right in and, and go for it. I will say that our product is a purely mechanical, physical medical device, right? So probably talk to Laura before you go somewhere with a physical product that you want to start showing everyone. Because um, I know for us, like we did hack like someone who gave us a good state to say like, hey, you need to file or you need to have a provisional, you need to have something filed and, and ready to go before you start running off with it. But I think for our product, it's it was getting it in people's hands was really what gave us the security and the understanding of product fit and having someone who wants to run off with a 3D printed prototype to use it uh, in surgery. So I would say, yeah, I, I still think it's really important to get on the ground and really meet with people and gain those connections because for us network has been the most important uh, or I would say one of the most important levers we've had throughout this whole um, startup journey but I would say yeah talk talk to some good mentors and people that have been there before you start running off uh, with a prototype showing it to everyone so excellent advice uh, Christine yeah, so maybe a combination here of Laura and, and, and Jillian is that um, definitely it all starts with your IP protection, right? And just understanding you are going into a new space and there's a um, there are laws that you will have to abide by um, and you want to be able to do good business wherever you're going. And it's important that you can you have the right to do business in the area that you're going. So making sure you understand those rights, filing for those rights as early as possible because there is... Um, there are laws that that govern from an intellectual property perspective um, how you obtain those rights. And then um, the other piece of that, I think, um, Jillian mentioned just getting on the ground and being able to, um, you know, see um, uh, the feasibility and the utility of what you're bringing in terms of, um, you know, your product and offering. We did it a little bit sort of reverse in that. Um, here in the US, we took time to speak with potential users of our technology to understand the problem we were solving, not just from our perspective and you know, being close to the invention, but also understanding how they would use it. And so I think that is important to understand what impact you are looking to create for your future buyers and users um, and what problem it will solve and the value of solving that, that problem. So doing your research, understanding your buyer and, and, and customer and the ecosystem you're going into is, is critical and it's responsible um, as you go into these markets. Thanks, Christine. And Stephanie, any, any last best advice that you'd like to share? Yeah, so I keep this placard on my desk, Futures Female. 
Um, and I just want to reinforce that uh, bias is global. Bias against women in leadership is global, unfortunately. Um, but I do think if you uh, prioritize your health and finding a community of people independent of gender um, to support you along your journey, that um, the world will catch up to the reality that women are just as equipped to lead us into a better world as everyone else. Thank, thank you all. This was a tremendous panel and y'all are an inspiration.